Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday the 19th of August. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Today's topic is maximizing Google Forms for the upcoming school year, and our special guest is Jen Jenkins. I'm going to turn the mic over to Maureen, who will now introduce Jen and ask her the newbie question. Great, thank you. I was thrilled when I found out that Jen had agreed to come on our show. She is an amazing educator here in Massachusetts. I followed her virtually online for years and then got to meet her at several different venues and realized I could just not have to choose my sessions and just sit in one of Jen's sessions for the entire day. She's knowledgeable, she gives you practical ideas, and she's funny. So Jen is the Director of Educational Technology for Lexington Public Schools in Massachusetts. She is an experienced middle and high school science teacher and formerly life science researcher who knows firsthand how technology can extend learning and engage students in ways that challenge them to higher levels of thinking. Jen is a Google for Education certified trainer, a Raspberry Pi certified educator, a 2016 MassQ Pathfinder, and a PBS lead digital innovator. As a regular presenter at regional and national conferences, Jen shares her passion for meaningful integration of digital tools by helping teachers gain confidence and proficiency in their use of tools. She curates useful technology resources, tip sheets, and integration ideas for educators on her blog, www.teachingforward.net, which you'll see the link in the chat. And she's also a co-host on Tech Educator Podcast. You can find her on Twitter at Teaching Forward at, at Teaching Forward. So, Jen, welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. And the newbie question today is what makes Google Forms such a valuable tool for teachers and students? Take it away, Jen. Thanks for having me on the show today, guys. I'm really excited to um, share some kind of innovative uses of Google Forms. And, and that's, I guess, part of my response with your newbie question is I think a lot of teachers think about forms as being a way to just ask simple questions from students, like um, for assessment purposes. But I thought we would share today some of the ways in which forms in conjunction with add-ons could be leveraged so that we could save time and create more efficiency in the kinds of paperwork things that take our time away from students but are un unfortunately necessary in our work as educators. So I love the idea of using forms to save time so that we can use our time in the classroom more effectively. So um, this is our, our presentation today, and I, I, as I said, we're going to focus on building efficient workflows with Google Forms. Um, I see lots of um, problems and, and inefficiencies sometimes in the work that we um, are required to do in our schools, and, and I think a lot of those can be solved by using Google Forms in ways that maybe we hadn't thought of before. So. So some of those use cases that I've had success with um, or that others may have experienced before are using Google Forms for things like club signups where we can um, allow students to select clubs and limit their uh, number of signups using add-ons. Uh, we'll be talking about add-ons today. Um, Walkthrough evaluations for administrators. Certificates of attendance after people attend different workshops um, using Google Forms to auto-create and send those certificates of attendance. And today our focus will be around using uh, these uh, Google Forms for discipline referrals. So we'll use that as a specific use case to just kind of highlight some of the features in Forms and maybe give you some ideas about how they could be used not just for discipline referrals but for other things as well. 
So the add-ons that, um, that I kind of think about when I think about a toolbox for automating workflows are uh, listed here. There are many add-ons, but these are the ones that I seem to turn to time and again so that um, I can take different uh, things that I might be doing and, and build in that efficiency. So the ones that we'll be focusing on today in our examples are the top two, Form Ranger and Form Mule. Um, but there are some others that, uh, depending on how much time we have, I have some slides at the end. Uh, we can talk about these other ones, Form Limiter and Autocrat. So I thought what we'd first do is talk about where we're headed today. So today we're going to focus on a discipline workflow. So I think all of us have um, this situation in our schools where if there are student discipline issues, there's some sort of process by which teachers would inform the main office, the school administrator that handles discipline. Um, you know, there may be one or multiple people that need to be involved, but there will be some trigger to inform people. A lot of times that's a piece of paper that you fill out that is sent down to the office. Um, and, and then what often happens, I find, is that um, action is taken by the administrator, but then teachers are sort of left out of the loop. It might be a couple of days before you hear back what happened with the student, and it creates some frustration on the part of teachers and administrators while they want to keep teachers in the loop, they get sidetracked onto other things. So I think um, finding a way to automate this process will help to increase communication flow and decrease the burden of you know, paperwork and, and finding teachers when they're not busy to update them on what's going on. <clears throat> so the workflow that we're going to walk through today um, kind of has these basic steps. So the first is that we'll create a form where teachers will enter the specifics around the discipline issue that they have witnessed, and that when they submit that form, that teachers will, um, that will automatically generate a notification by email to the administrator. And when they receive that notification, they will be able to write from their email to click on a link and view the details of that incident report from the teacher. Um, they can also um, record any notes that they want to share with the teacher or even personal notes that they don't want shared with the teacher but that can be referenced later and any specific action taken. And when they finish that side, when the administrator completes that portion, they would then submit this form again and it would automatically trigger a response to the teacher who referred the student. And the beauty of that is that we're keeping the communication loop really uh, flowing without additional work. And of course, there's also the fact that um, this information is recorded in forms means that we can pull up a spreadsheet and look at um, the history. So this can be very helpful when we're meeting with parents or um, having uh, meetings to focus on concerns about students within the school that we can really get visibility and even pull reports on different grade levels. So it, it just is a nice way to collect the information. So what I've done to get us started today is there is a template that I created and it's really just a, a discipline uh, referral form that I already built so that it will just save us some time if you wanted to um, kind of practice this on the side either while we're in the recording or later. Um, and, and from that template, we'll be stepping through some of the different features. And of course, since you're copying this, you're welcome to make any changes that you want to customize it for your school. I'll be sure to highlight the pieces that are kind of non-negotiables that, that are important in order for the form to flow and work but you'll see that many of these things can be customized to suit your specific school or language that you might use around discipline referrals. So Peggy's added in the chat that, um, that link that will force you to make a copy of the form. So this would be, um, you'd have to be signed into your Google account because you'd want to save this in your Google Drive. Um, but the, the form is uh, accessible through the, the link that Peggy has added in the chat. The links are also in the 
um, presentation, but I know that it's easier to click on them from the chat window on the left. When you, um, so there's a question here about um, how to force people to make a copy. Um, in a second when I go into screen share, I'll show you that it's actually amazingly simple and yet so handy because um, a lot of times we share things and we want people to make a copy and if we share them as view only, they have to go through a couple steps to do that and for people that are maybe unfamiliar with Google, they may not know how to do that. So I'll be sure to show that to you in a moment when we switch over to screen share. Um, so these links, you'll need to make copies of two pieces. One is the form that we will be actually editing and tweaking and um, adding in some, um, some of the add-ons piece, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the other thing that you'll need to copy is the Form Ranger list template. So Form Ranger is an add-on that we'll be explaining its use in a, in a few minutes. But um, this is a reference document that will just uh, give you the ability to um, you know, have something pre-made so you're not creating it on the fly when we're working through this. Again, these, both of these things can be customized to suit your needs. So when it, if you're trying to follow along and do it on your own, you would want these things, but, but I'm going to screen share so that you can see it and this recording would be available if you wanted to kind of watch first as I go through and then know that you have that recording to um, kind of walk you through it when you go to create it on your own. So let's see. All right, so I'm actually going to switch to screen share at this point so I can um, show you the specific steps that we're going to take in the form itself. And I'll first start by showing you the um, how to make a copy. So let me just switch that over. And here. All right, so are we seeing the screen now? Okay, perfect, Peggy, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk through how to do the make a copy. So the question about that was, you know, how do you get to that point? So if I go to, to drive and I go to a recent file, at the top of any of your documents in Google Drive, the link appears. And that link, so up here at the top, that link is, um, you know, I always tell people to think about it like a social security number because that link does not change um, ever. So I can rename this file, I can move it, I can edit it, I can share it with different people. All of those things don't affect this really unique link to the file up here. So, um, so this file link up here, if I have set the form up, um, at first I need to make sure whatever the document is that I want to allow people to make a copy of, I need to be sure that the permissions for that document are set to anyone with the link can view. So in a form it's a little different. Normally you'd hit the share button, but uh, from here, would have to choose add collaborators because I'm trying to share the actual um, trying to add, share the actual form. So I had to set this to anyone with the link can edit because you can't do forms are a little strange. You can't really do can view, but on a document it would be a little simpler. And then see up at the top here where it says has this really long link with the unique file ID. Then at the end it says slash edit. So you would erase the slash edit part and just type in copy. That is the link that you would share. So for a document, it might be a little more straightforward to show you that. Just give it a moment to load so that you can see it on the screen share. So again, same thing. I want to first make sure the share permissions mean that other people can see it with a link. So I'd click the blue share button. I typically hit advanced to see all of my options. And normally it would be set to private only you can view. So you would change this and be sure it's set to anyone with a link. 
And then up here where you see the slash edit, you would erase that portion. So it's the very end, the last slash, and anything else that's after that, which typically starts with the word edit. And then I would type in the word copy. This is the link that I would give someone else. So if I go into a new page, this is what should be um, what you should be um, getting or, or your users would be seeing. I'm close that. Just gonna check because I can't hear anyone and make sure there's no questions. Great. Alright, so hopefully that is helpful for understanding how to make a copy. That is pretty handy. So now that I'm in the form itself, you know in a Google form there is there's the view version of the form what the user would see. So that would look like this, where they would enter their information. But I'm in the form editor. And this is where I can change the questions and add questions, move them around, that sort of thing. So in this um, setup, the, the first thing that we have to do is make sure that, um, that there is a question that helps direct the form so that we know if the form is being entered on the part of the teacher who's recording the incident or the administrator who's following up and, and recording their action taken. So this workflow is very simplified. It uses a single form to do two different things. So this first question is how we split that, how we use one form to do two things. This first question is using um, a great feature in Google Forms called Forms Branching. The idea with Forms Branching means that you can set a question where people are directed to different parts of the form based on their answer. So what I mean by that is if someone clicks initial staff incident report here, that would, according to this uh, box here, it tells me it will force them into the submit form when they finish completing this page. So you might have noticed when you filled out forms before that sometimes they're all on one page and other times you have to go to different pages. It's those different pages which are called sections. And so if you want to have a form like this that has two purposes, one side of the form is handled where the staff person enters their information, the other portion of the form is for the administrator, then we create two sections. So this question helps us to do that. So the, the question here says, um, to the right it says submit form, or if it's an administrator it will continue to the next section. In order to get this feature or this ability to change sections to come up, you need two things. One is you need to have more than one section in your form in order for this to even be a choice. To create a section in a form on the right hand side where you add your different form elements, there's a little thing that looks like an equal sign and that is how you would add an additional section. So this form that I've had you make a copy of already has another section. And that section is down here. You'll notice that it says section two of two. And so this already has two sections. You can have as many as you want, but by default typically a form has only one section. So you need to have first a second section to go to. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to turn on this feature. So at the bottom of the question to the right, there is a three dot menu right here. And there are some different options here. The one that you need to select in order to make these um, sections, um, you know, to do this whole go to page based on answer feature is this one right here that says go to section based on answer. Once you check that, you'll have the ability like I do here to change where people go on the form. Okay, so creating the two sections and creating a question somewhere in the form. I typically do it at the beginning, um, but it actually could be anywhere on that first page of the form. So that's my first question is entry type. It should already be set up, but for your reference, that's how you would branch that and, and force people into different parts of the form. So the second part is where I need to collect the staff email. 
Now, I think for some of you that have used forms before, you may be questioning why this is here because there is a way to force emails to be collected by um, as a way that when you set up the form. So this is done very purposefully, and that's because this form is used, the same form will be used for two different things as we explained earlier. You have the teacher entering their information and the staff member entering their information. So, I'm sorry, and the, and the administrator. So because of that, I need to capture and hold on to the staff member email as its own question, not as part of the feature in forms where you can automatically grab that. Um, so when I think about that, and, and also the next question, these next two questions, staff email and student name, are things that are typically a very long list. And not only are they a long list, but they're a long list that will change throughout the course of the year. As teachers and students maybe change, you get students transferring in, transferring out, teachers coming in and out. Um, there is a way to maintain this list of response choices more efficiently than going in and editing this manually. And the way that you can do that is with a forms add-on. So, Add-ons are features and forms that allow you to take and, um, you know, to, to, extend, to extend the features within forms. And when you add an add-on within forms, when, when, you, um, when you install that in your user account, what happens is you can, you can be assured that that's going to be available for every form that you make in the future. So, to add these, um, these features into to forms to, to um, manage your add-ons, in the top right-hand corner of the form editor, there's a three-dot menu. If you do that, you can choose add-ons. And this will take you to the add-ons manager. This is where you would search for other things that are add-ons for forms. I just want to point out that some of the things we're working with today are add-ons for forms, and other things we're using today are add-ons for sheets. So the file type actually is important because an add-on is specific to a file type. So Form Ranger is specific to Google Forms. So I would just sort, search for Form Ranger. And then for you, if you've never installed it, you'll have a button here that I believe says install, where you'd accept the permission. This is one of the many wonderful add-ons that have been created by the folks at New Visions for Public Schools in New York. So once the add-on is there, we'll be able to use it to populate these, um, the staff email and the student name from a spreadsheet. At the beginning of our session, I mentioned to you that you were copying two documents. One was the form template, and the other was a spreadsheet that has some lists in it. And that's the spreadsheet we're going to need and be referencing to populate the stuff here. So instead of typing in all the staff emails one at a time, I can use Form Ranger to push those in and to keep it updated on a regular basis. So in order to use Form Ranger, first you have to install it, which I've already done, and second, you need to um, you need to be sure that the question type that you're trying to use Form Ranger in is either a multiple choice or a drop-down list style question. So it can't be an open response, for example. So have my staff email question, and I have the student name question. These are two that I would like to use these lists that I have. So I'm going to click the puzzle piece here to launch my Form Ranger add-on. Your list will appear differently. Um, I have things that I've installed in the past. So depending on what add-ons you have previously installed, this list will look different for you. I'm going to choose Form Ranger. I'm going to start that. And it's going to open up a little window on the side of my screen that will walk me through the steps. The first thing it does is it's looking for any question that fits the criteria of a question that could have a list of responses. So on the right hand side here, you'll notice that there are different questions showing up. 
the only ones that will show up are the ones that are, are the types that Form Ranger can support. So entry type is one of those questions, but I, I actually don't want to use that um, this for that question. I want to use it for the staff email question and the student name one. So if I click staff email, then I can check this box, populate values from list. And what it's going to do is it's going to now search in my Google Drive for any spreadsheets that could function as lists. And I have one that I created called Form Ranger Reference. You can call it whatever you want. Um, you can use the one that I gave you as, as a starting point. But you select the file and to select so that it will pull that information. And then it's asking me, well, okay, if, if that's a file, it has, if it has multiple sheets, it gives me a chance to change the sheet, but I only have one sheet in this form. And then it's looking for the column header. It's, not, it's important to note that when you use Form Ranger, you do need a column header because it's always looking to the first row for the column header. If you don't have a column header, what will happen is the first name on the list will be cut off. So just be aware that you need a column header. So I'm going to choose the, um, this question is this, the teacher email. So I'm going to change this choice to staff email. And then it's pulling all that information from my spreadsheet. I choose next. And it says, well, OK, well, what do you want to call this list? I'm just going to call this staff email. And I'm going to save and populate. So now it's pulling the information from the um, spreadsheet into this document. Now, this isn't much of a list, but typically in my school I have a much bigger list. I've got, you know, thousands of students or, um, or hundreds of staff, if not more. So this is why Form Ranger is very handy because keeping that list updated is very cumbersome. Another, um, another thing you could do is you can actually, a lot of people don't know this, but if you have a spreadsheet, so let me just tab over here you have a spreadsheet and you want to copy the names or, or whatever on the spreadsheet, you can actually click in the first answer option and paste that list and it will populate all of the answers. So you don't have to use Form Ranger. The advantage of Form Ranger is that if you use it, so let me just clear this again, if you use Form Ranger, what's beautiful about that is you can actually set it let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to populate this list for student names. You can set it up so that it's constantly checking the spreadsheet for any updates. So the cut and paste is really quick that I just showed you, but the Form Ranger gives you the advantage of automatically keeping the spreadsheet list of choices fresh so that you don't have to go into the form and change them. So for things like this, where it's a workflow and you want it used all year and teacher and students come in and out, you could have a master list of student and teacher names that you use. And is the only place that you're keeping it updated is the spreadsheet, not having to go to this or other forms where they're being used. I'm going to set this. Now I recommend that you use drop down list for student name because if you're trying to um, collect data, it's much easier because if you allow teachers to type in the, la the first student's name, then they're likely to be inconsistent about that, um, maybe using a nickname for a kid or mistyping a name so that when you try to sort later to pull data on a student, it's not going to be as effective. So whenever you can force people to pick choices, it helps keep your data more clean. The last thing I want to point out about Form Ranger is, as I said, it can always sort of check back and constantly be updating the list of choices from the spreadsheet. In order to do that, I typically will either turn on the timer so it's checking back every hour, or I'm just going to turn it on form submit so that every time someone submits a form, it's double checking that list and updating it as if it's changed. So we just toggled that from the bottom. Now I can, um, now I can close this menu. Now I have my first few questions. The incident date is pretty straightforward. I'm going to leave that as is. 
And just checking real quick to see if we have any questions over here. Okay, so the spreadsheet populated those. And then the other one that I like to use a spreadsheet for, or you could do the copy paste because it's pretty simple, is the list of reasons for a referral. So you could change this list if you wanted. I, we did it in order of like severity, like the least severe to the most severe violations, but you could group them differently if you want. And you could use that copy paste that I showed you where you highlight them, you copy it, and then you go into the form, and then you just paste it in the first one, and it will copy all that information down into, into your list. So the rest of it is pretty straightforward as far as the form build goes. We have where the teacher would enter the reason. We want to make sure in our school district that parents have been contacted, that the teachers made an attempt to communicate with parents. So we like to have that as part of our form. Um, we have some information about that. And then any consequences the teacher might have given. So then we move into the second part of the, of the form. We talked about the different sections. So this top section, which would go uh, where the teacher would fill out, when the teacher finishes, it will cause them, uh, it will bring them to a submit form button. So they would be all finished. For the administrator, if they're in the form, you notice at the top here, if they choose an administrator response, that's going to cause them to go first, they'll see this first section here, so they'll see all the information the teacher filled in. But then it'll bring them to section two, um, because this is information that the administrator needs to complete. So in section two, we've put in different things that the administrator may have done, like whether they contacted the parents or issued a detention. Again, you can customize this list. Um, <clears throat> and then some more details about any administrative action. So then there are a couple fields here. One is comments to referring staff. These are comments that will be included when we send the automated email notification to the staff member. And these questions, these ones right here, these will be specifically held in the spreadsheet that only the administrator has access to. So sometimes there may be notes that you want to keep um, about an incident as an administrator. So that's how those would be cataloged. So then the, the last piece is an administrative password. And the administrative password, it sounds really fancy, but all that I've done here is try to prevent the, an accidental um, situation where maybe a teacher put at the top they chose the, that they were the administrator not realizing what they were doing. And if they were forced into this part of the, the form, it would, it would cause them to, to not be able to proceed because they wouldn't have this administrator password. Um, so it's really just to keep people from completing the part of the form that really is, is for um, a di you know, different user to complete. So the way that we set this part up is using data validation. So I've created this as a short answer question. And you'll notice if you click to edit this question, it says uh, right below it, text contains the word behave. And there's a little note here to the right. So what I've done is I've set up data validation, which means that when they type in the response, the response or the password needs to be the word behave, all lowercase. And if it doesn't match that, it won't let them submit the form. And that's because I required this question, so it will be checking to make sure it meets the criteria that I set. The way you set up data validation is through these three dots in the bottom right. So click the three dots, choose response validation. Be sure it's a short answer question and then you set your password to whatever you want. And then this right here is just um, the message that they'll get if they enter it incorrectly. So that is the form itself. And then what we'll do is show how, you know, how this all comes together. So when you create the form, I'm just going to click in here and just put in a sample entry. 
just so I have some data to work with. So you're going to want to have a, you'll notice when I go to next because I, choo I chose that I was a teacher, it's bringing me right here to submit. So I wanted to do this just so I could have some responses to work with. So I want to go into the spreadsheet that contains the response. So when you're working in forms, go to responses. There's this little icon in the top right here that will bring you to the responses spreadsheet or if you don't have one, will allow you to create that. I'm going to create my responses spreadsheet. And now I need to set up the, the other part, which is the automated response to the teacher. So to do that, I'm using, uh, and I also want to set up the automated email to trigger to the administrator. So the way that I would do that is I'm going to go into a different add-on called Form Range and Form Mule. Sorry about that. So Form Mule is an add-on for Sheets. I've already added it myself, but if you haven't had it in there before, you would click Add-ons at the top menu, Manage Add-ons, and you would search for Form Mule. Because I have it already, I'm just going to launch it. And I'm going to walk you through the setup of Form Mule so that these automated emails, both to the teacher and to the administrator, will be created. So I need to set up the sheet that contains the data. So it's this Form Responses. I'm going to flip on this button that says that every time a form is submitted, it's going to trigger this um, automatic email notification. The third thing I want to do on this first screen is click this log the I thought I did that. Sorry, let me just go back. Let me just go back and enter a response. Oops. I'll do an initial incident. All right, so I'm going to see if that will work. I'm going to set up this form ranger. I mean, formula, I keep calling it the wrong thing. <laughs> so, formula, checking my form responses, edit URL, and that's that first screen. So, next, I'm hitting the next button. And it's asking me, how many different emails do I want this tool to create? So Formule, its function is that it will create customized emails based on certain conditions. So the two conditions that I'm thinking about in this use case are, one condition is the teacher submits their, um, their, their entry, so I want the administrator to be notified. So it's an administrator notification is one thing. And then I want the teacher to be informed of what action was taken. So there are kind of two emails I want this to generate depending on what's happening in the, at, the, at the form. So I'm going to choose two unique email templates. You can do as many as you want. And then I want to name them. So maybe I'll name the first one um, admin notification. And the second one I'll name teacher follow up. You can call these whatever you want. And then the question is how, what is the reason, why, like what's going to cause it to send? I can set the send condition. So the first one I want it to send any time, I want it to send if the timestamp is not null, if it's not, if it's not empty. So basically that's going to send for any new form submission. And for the teacher follow up, 
I'm going to do, now this one is only going to happen when the administrator takes an action. So I'm going to say if administrator action, or maybe I'll do, yeah, not null. So not null just means not empty. So these are the two rules I want to follow for these emails to be triggered. Okay. So I'm going to save these templates. And now it's going to let me create those individual emails because there are different emails. The administrator will get a different email than the teacher. I'm going to edit the templates and I can do these one at a time. So the way that this works is it creates this menu for you. It's actually really um, handy because on the right hand side are all of the different headers for the columns based on the form that we made. So all of the, all of the different questions in the forms result in these different tags on the right hand side. So in the to field, for the admin notification, I can pull a tag or I'm actually going to put in the name of the administrator. So I'm going to put my name in here. If you have multiple administrators, there is a way that you can handle that. I'm going to just simplify it here and put in a single administrator. You can put in multiple people just by separating them with commas. Um, or if you want you could use, um, it's kind of a little more involved and we won't cover it here, but for those of you that um, want to explore further, you could use a VLOOKUP formula in the spreadsheet to actually look up, depending on the name of the student, who the administrator is. Because I know a lot of schools have administrators assigned either by student name or by grade level. So if you want that uh, functionality, you could absolutely do that. We're just going to keep it simpler here because this is already a lot of information. So I'm just putting in the name at the top of the administrator. And, um, and then in the subject, I'm going to just say um, discipline referral from, and I can put in like the teacher's name if I wanted by just clicking that and see how that's filling in this, um, this little tag so that will push into the email what the teacher's information is. So then in the body here I'd like to summarize um, and then I can put in uh, student and then I can start to populate what the email will look like. So if I want the email to kind of summarize the, so the student name, maybe I want the reason for referral in the email, and maybe I'll just have, then I want the link. So at the very bottom, the live form URL, or I'm sorry, the edit form URL is what I want. So the, in the very beginning of this, this um, form mule setup, you might remember that we checked a box that said, um, include edit URL. And what that is, is it's a link that goes back to the form, but it has filled in all of the information the teacher had already placed into the form. So it's bringing you back into the form with all the entry information the teacher had. So that's where the administrator needs to go so that it keeps all of the data about this incident on the single line in the spreadsheet. So that's the most important thing to include in the email. And if you wanted, you can include other pieces about the referral. Um, but the most important thing is this form edit URL. And I can preview this. I want to see what it looks like. Okay. All right. And then the other one I want to do is set up. I'm a little wondering. Okay. So then I'm going to set up the teacher follow-up email. So let me, oh, the admin notification. So I'm going to go back and edit the teacher follow-up. So the teacher follow-up is going to go to the teacher email. So that's going to be staff email. So I'm grabbing this tag over here. And the subject is just going to be, uh, Discipline follow-up. 
And um, and from here, I can I can type in a whole email. I'm just going to keep it simple for us right now. But I'm going to put in the student name and the incident date just from these tags. And then I'm going to put in. Remember, there was that administrative action, what they did, and I'm just going to grab the notes to, let's see, comments to referring staff. That's why I have that as a separate field so that I could just put it in this email and whatever the administrator types in that field in the form would be what pops into the email for the staff member. So now I'm going to save that. Okay. I'm going to send those emails. So the edit URL is not there yet, probably because I need to fill this out one more time. And let me just set this up so you can see how it works. Because now that the form's set up, then that should. Let's finish this. Okay. So that should create the edit URL. Let me go back and check. Yeah, there it goes. So now um, with this most recent entry, it has the information, it has this edit URL. So let me just show you the email, what this looks like here. So here it's sending this email that tells me as the administrator what's happening with the, the what the student name is and the event. But as the administrator would click this edit URL and be brought back into the form. It's telling me this because I'm editing a previous response. I don't want to change any of the teacher entry, but the form, in order to keep it into one form, it's it's kind of Clean, so I can choose administrative response now because now I'm coming into this form as the administrator. I'm not touching any of these other fields because this is the incident information from the teacher. But because I'm choosing administrator, when I select next here, now it's going to let me choose the action. Now I'm getting a whole separate part of the form that wasn't available to the teacher. So maybe I had a conference with a student. And and I would put in the notes that I want the staff to receive, and then I need my admin password and notice as soon as I type it correctly. See the submit button is it's going to allow me to press that. So now that I've done that, what will happen is the teacher will receive an email that will look like this. It could be a lot, you know, you could have a lot more information, but this is just a simple follow-up to the teacher. I have the information about how I responded. So that is an example of one of the ways that you can use forms to, um, to set up a workflow for discipline. Now I just have to toggle back <laughs> to my screen share. Let's see if I can figure that out. Let's see. Peggy, feel free to help me. How I take that. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm happy to take any questions that people might have about this. I know it was a lot of information, but um, hopefully it just gave you a, a sense of the ways in which forms can be used beyond maybe the ways that you've used them in the past. Thanks so much, Jen. I think everybody learned a lot. Um, I did capture some questions. So let me go back to the beginning. How can you get admin to buy in to using these digital tools? This teacher gets pushback from admin who are not comfortable with digital forms. So in our school, the administrators actually were so happy because it really made things easier for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
Certainly it depends. You know, the question is who would set this up in the first place? Do you have someone that's comfortable setting it up? So we created a, um, a generic account on our Google admin console. So it's not an account that is owned by a particular person. There's an account that is really just at a teacher level of permissions. But the, the username and password are um, shared with a few people to create things like this. Mm -hmm. So we might have, say, um, you know, one of the more tech savvy teachers or an integration specialist or someone from IT might um, create the workflow itself and then sit with the administrator and show them how it works. Because really, if it's created, the administrator, all they need to do is click the button, you know, click the link in the email that they get. Right. And log their information, and then it's really quite simple. So for, for the administrators that I've worked with, um, they, they were so happy about this because it was a much more efficient way for them, and, and they, they were feeling the teacher's frustration with regard to um, them feeling kind of out of the loop. You know, teachers mm -hmm. go through and fill out an office referral, and then they feel like, well, I don't even know if they did anything. They didn't say anything, but the administrator, you know, is trying to not interrupt the teacher's class, but doesn't have an opportunity to, to speak with them, maybe at a time when they're available. And so um, it just seemed to really create a, an environment where teachers were feeling like they're, um, they were being heard and valued you know, when they were sending office referrals. So in that way, it was very motivating for the administrative staff to you know, have this improved communication flow without added work and if anything the ability to pull data was much more seamless and for those that are not tech savvy again there might be someone in the district that could help them pull that data together but you know if there's someone that could create the setup like we just walked through that would be done in a generic account that might be say like admin at whatever your domain is and it doesn't need to have specific access beyond that of a teacher. You just don't want the form information to be owned by a specific user on the domain. It's kind of cleaner to have it be like a generic account. Right, okay. Uh, would you use or could you use something like the the template email to send to parents? Absolutely. So Form Mule is really powerful because you can create multiple email types. So you could see, mm -hmm. you notice when we did this, we did a third, you know, we did two emails, but you could create a third email or even a fourth email. You could have emails going to guidance as well as the teacher. You could have emails going to parents. And when you create the separate email, you can choose what pieces of information you include in that email. So a parent might get a different comment field. You, you could even create a separate comment field in the form that says, you know, um, comments for parents. And then the educator, you know, the administrator might phrase the information differently to a parent or might have, um, you know, some background information for the parent in that piece. And so that's the beauty of Form Mule is that you can set up customized emails. So depending on your role in, in the organization, we can create very specific pieces of information that are pulled from the form that go back to those people, um, you know, keeping, keeping the right people informed with the correct information. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, you've answered this one as far as who sets it up. Can you do all this if you're not a GAFE school that is Google Apps for Education? As long as teachers and admins are using Google and have Google accounts? So I would say yes, but, but with caution. So yes, you can because yeah. you, um, we didn't set it up so that they had to log into their account. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, and as a matter of fact, um, the teachers themselves, none of the teachers would need to have Google accounts because they're just getting emails. And as long as we have the email right. address, that's how it's getting back to the teacher. And a Google form can be entered into, you know, anyone can use that. Um, the caution I would say is that for, for Google Apps for Education, there is a privacy policy umbrella that is much more extensive and much more 
um, protective of student information. So my, my concern would be in using like a private account would be the student name and, and that data being uh, less protected. So you know, maybe right. a workaround would be that you would use student first name and last initial or something um, so that it's not uh, you know, I would I would just be a little cautious just because of the difference in privacy policies from Google Apps for Education versus um, a public Google account. Sure. Okay. Can you explain or give a quick explanation on how you use the form limited and autocrat add-ons? Absolutely. So those are really wonderful. Form limiter allows you to limit the number of responses or it can even limit the time. So some examples of how I've used it specifically are if I'm doing like a camp sign up and I have 25 slots, mm -hmm. I want to close the form or close the people that are picking that choice on the form after I've received 25 people who signed up for that particular camp. Mm -hmm. So it can be used for that. It can also be used for, um, for example, this past year when we were doing National Honor Society um, applications, we wanted kids to submit those applications by a certain date and time. And if they tried to submit it after that date and time, we wanted the form to be turned off and not accepting new responses. You can do that manually, but it's just something someone has to remember. So it's nice to be able to use form limiter to set the time and date at which the form becomes um, locked for any future submissions. So mm -hmm. it just keeps it really clean. So that's form limiter. Autocrat is probably my favorite of all of the forms add-ons because, or sheets actually, um, because what it does is it lets you create a document template or any, any file type really, but I usually use it with Google Docs. You would create a document template. So for example, we talked earlier about certificates of attendance. Mm -hmm. So I could create a Google Doc that looks like a certificate of attendance with images in there, a little uh, you know, signature um, image for the trainer, stuff like that. Um, and then I could create little merge tags that use um, the little greater than uh, greater than, less than signs are uh, bracketing either side of some words. And those, um, and what it will do is it will let you use uh, data in a spreadsheet mm -hmm. as a mail merge. So it's, it's really essentially a mail merge where you take for each row of data in the spreadsheet, it will create a customized document using a template that you create. So as I said, that's one example for, um, for using it for certificates of attendance when someone, you know, fills out, say, the, um, the survey to a, a workshop they attended, it will automatically create a certificate of attendance where it will put in their name mm -hmm. because they filled out their name um, in the form. It will put in the workshop they took because they chose that from a drop-down list, um, that kind of thing. So it's um, really straightforward to use. It's a, it's a great mail merge tool that will email the documents to people with the file attached and you can even set the type of file, whether it stays as an editable Google Doc or it turns into maybe a PDF that's view only. So you have a lot of um, control over what that looks like. But it's different than Formule because you can only create one template. You can't change, you know, it's, it's going to be customized for each entry, but, um, but what's different about AutoCred is there's typically a document that you're customizing for each person um, who fills out the form. Great. And there are probably many, many other add-ons. Wow. <laughs> uh, those were the questions that I was able to capture. You answered a couple during the presentation. Thanks so much for today's presentation. My pleasure. It was great to share that with folks. And I will now turn the mic over to Peggy who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Jen. I have learned so much and I know I'm going to be watching the recording so I can go back and pause it as we go along and try all those things and it's so helpful to have all those steps on the slides too so we can kind of go step by step. 
We have some great shows coming up. Next week, we have Jennifer Casatad joining us. She has written an amazing book called Social Media, and it's all about help using social media to help move students from just digital citizenship to digital leadership. Lots of great tips for us. We won't have a show on September 2nd because that's the Labor Day weekend in the United States. We're still finalizing several of our September shows, but we do have Patty Hardy lined up on September 30th to teach us all about creating breakout EDU games. That will be awesome. And then October 7th, we have two fantastic teachers who are going to be our featured teachers. Wow. They are co-teachers, and they're going to share some things that they do with coding. They're fifth grade teachers. So we're really looking forward to all of them. Hope you'll come back every Saturday to join us. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate classroom. And as long as your event is public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link, or there's a tab in the live binder to do that. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month as well. The video collection for the shows are available on iTunes U. As you exit the session, the survey link should come up. Uh, the tab should open in your browser automatically. There's a, going to be a, the, yeah, the link is already in the, the chat box for the survey. You can also take the link from within the live binder as well. At the end of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate, and it will print out with your name. And thanks to Patty Ruffing for, for sending these out. Make sure, though, when you request this, if you do so, that it's a personal email address that you use rather than a school email. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to Jen Judkins, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>